welcome to our talk on cost and resource management um, management on CI/CD infrastructure by using OpenShift. So, a few words about ourselves. My name is Saulus Prosmantas. I work as a SRE at SDX. My name is Marcel Harry. I work as a cloud architect in the services team at Red Hat. I mainly focus on customers within the Alps region um, and there on infrastructure and OpenShift 4 topics. Hello, my name is Radu Domno. I work as a cloud consultant uh, in the services team as Marcel in the Alps region. I'm focusing mostly on OpenShift and uh, cloud native ecosystem in general. Okay, thank you guys. So we all work uh, at SDX at the moment. Uh, this is a six group company um, providing um, financial market infrastructure services in Switzerland. Uh, there are over 200 employees, and we build DLT-based solutions. Um, we're part of blockchain network. Primarily, we use R3 Corda, but as you can see, we're also partner with Hyperledger and Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. So we build a number of products where we provide trading infrastructure for digitalized assets also centralized um, security depository, market surveillance, market data, quite a bit of products which requires agile and um, scalable infrastructure. So company started 2018, we provided um, proof of concepts and later on we adjusted to the, our vision where we striving to to build next generation digital assets infrastructure, which bridges traditional financial um, world and new digital, um, including crypto asset world. So this requires scalable uh, CICD infrastructure. And the first question, why does it have to be container driven? Um, first, we want to build it once and run it everywhere. It means developer builds on, on the laptop, compiles it, um, pushes the code, um, CICD system uh, releases securely, signs it. So it has to be scalable, first of all, uh, to accommodate week or weekends uh, loads. There, there's a end of sprint when there's a lot of um, things happening. It also has to be rapid and with uniform tools, meaning we want to use same tools for um, building the code or deploying the infrastructure. And for FinTech, company security is, is, is number one priority. So we, we want to enhance it with, with the infrastructure and we have to have flexible configuration to segregate development from from release and or deployment workflows. So improving security is extremely important for us. Also debugging, um, same as like developer debugs on their laptop, they need same capabilities to, to have it in CI CD pipeline. We chose GitLab. Here's the, the architecture of GitLab, which is on the left, you can see GitLab server where developer pushes the code uh, and there's a API uh, where GitLab runners connects. So first of all, it registers with the GitLab token and then it constantly pulls uh, if there are any pipeline and jobs available. And based on the type of, of workloads, it starts um, a number of runners, uh, jobs. It scales through the nodes in in the pods. GitLab runner types. We can segregate GitLab runners into multiple types um, based on uh, on security requirements or based on type of sizes. So for example, um, developer feature branches, they could be run on shared 
uh, auto scalable renders and um, release, they need more secure environments, which leads to um, OpenShift features. Okay, secure builds. Um, this is one of the, as I said, important features to run uh, these builds separately from, from each other. So when we run a new job, it has to be separated. So there should be no previous uh, artifacts or, or workloads. Um, OpenShift provides a non-privileged user um, by default. So we segregate by user ID. Also separate projects and namespaces um, can, can run separate um, jobs. It integrates quite nice with HashiCorp Vault, where we store all the secrets. And it also provides dynamic secret capability. So when we log into GitLab or S3, every time new secret is generated. For, for releases and for extremely secure loads, we run it in special um, hosts with a trusted execution environment. So why OpenShift? This is comprehensive offering, which provides the enhanced um, security and enhanced scalability. It has some extra robustness and performance. It also compliant and um, very development friendly. And we also get great support from our friends at Red Hat, um, where Radu and uh, Marcel that could brief us in, how did we achieve uh, scalability and um, reducing the cost of, uh, of CI-CD workloads? Marcel? Yeah, thank you, Solis. So let's talk about one of the features that are coming with OpenShift, and especially when we combine OpenShift with a public cloud like Azure. Maybe next slide, please. Um, and when we are developing in such an agile environment, we actually um, kind of like need to address also very elastic demands. So people are kind of like busy, especially when it goes towards the release, they are busy spinning up um, new features or actually just bug fixing things. And, and so we get a lot of things being deployed. And when we look at what SDX deploys um, within a single deployment for, for a um, member network, then it's actually multiple deployments, databases, seeded jobs, everything together. So it's quite some kind of resources. And if you are able to just spin them up with a finger snip, then it kind of like you end up with tons of things being spawned since, since it's so easy. But still, development happens mostly only during business hours, so maybe during 8 to 9 to 10, maybe a little bit more hours, but at least hopefully not at the weekend, which in the end means um, more or less your cloud is going to be idle during around two-thirds of the time. And when you look at how you consume cloud, you consume clouds based on, on, on the usage. So you pay for what you use. So if you don't want to use it, you just have resources idling around and this can make a cloud environment quite expensive. And especially if it's idling two thirds um, of the time. So let's make that environment also more elastic um, towards a uh, cloud perspective. Next slide, please. So when we look at how um, Kubernetes scheduler works, um, we, can, we can use this behavior to actually then drive how things are getting scaled out. And <clears throat> when uh, a new pod is getting scheduled, the scheduler looks um, um, at the part that is being scheduled, it checks for its val validity. It checks whether the part is valid or not, and then it looks at all the available nodes and checks which 
one might fit. And then if there are some found, it prioritizes and the cubelet will start um, the part on the knob. Now, next slide, please. When we look at an integration with, with a cloud provider, we actually um, get OpenShift tightly integrated with cloud provider API, which means that we are able to spawn machines just like parts. So um, as, as we spawn a machine, we, we get it, it joins automatically, automatically the cluster and it will serve workload. Now with, with a pod, you actually also have a replication controller, which just watches whether your um, pods are still alive and whether the desired amount of replicas is still running. And kind of like parts of that, um, similar is the machine sets for machines. And they are kind of like the template that define in which availability zone, in which network, based on which um, image your machine should run. Next slide, please. Now, if, if we, we look at the feature of the autoscaler, we have um, something that watches how resources are getting scheduled. And when there are no available nodes being found, a pod stays in a pending state with not enough resources available. And so the, the cluster autoscaler then sees that and actually provisions a new node to the cluster. That node will join the cluster and the pod gets scheduled. And we can see that on that animation on the right hand side where the pod is pending, machine got scheduled, got deployed, and the pod is part of the cloud. Now there is um, um, the cluster autoscaler, which is um, um, the global configuration, and then we can actually schedule, uh, we can actually configure the cluster autoscaler to configure uh, per machine sets. And so you can have a different autoscaling functionality for GitLab CICD runners, um, and you can have another one for, for your regular work nodes. Next slide, please. Now, when we see the cluster autoscaler in action, and this is the view on one week, we actually can see that it automatically adds quite a bunch of nodes, then removes them again, and so on. And on the right-hand side, we have the flat line over the weekend where no development happens. So this is kind of like we can see that we um, kind of like scale out our used resources um, kind of like one third of the cluster, it goes up and down. Next slide, please. Now, this ballooning and up and down on, on and releasing resources means we're able to cut quite some costs. In, in that case, it's actually some 10k zero per month that we're able to cut things. And as I mentioned, the cluster autoscaler also compacts cluster and compacting clusters in OpenShift always means that workload is getting evicted. And evicting workload in OpenShift means that pods are getting killed and new replicas are spawned on another node. Now on, on a busy cluster when things are being developed, this actually can lead to failures in terms of Let's assume you have an integration pipeline running, testing particular parts, and then they are suddenly evicted. So this might interrupt things. And um, part of that is you can actually annotate, at the beginning of a CI run, you can annotate your parts that they are not safe to evict. And so the cluster autoscaler will not try to evict them and the nodes will stay. And then you can actually just remove that flag at the end and then the cluster autoscaler is able to release the resources. And now since people usually don't clean up when they just spawn, um, we also quite heavily invested into downscaling the available um, the deployed replicas and so on so that 
the cluster automatically starts compacting. Now, ballooning up and down, usually throwing things away is quite fast. Um, provisioning new VMs still takes some time, still also in the cloud environment. And one of the things um, where we've seen issues there are CI runs, and Radu is now going to tell you about how this looks um, like now at SDX and how we solved it there that we get faster provisioning times. Thank you, Marcel. Next slide, please. So, as Marcel mentioned, provisioning of VMs takes in the cloud from, uh, from five up to 20 minutes. Uh, when running a CI-CD pipeline, developer uh, must wait uh, already some time until the, uh, the image will be built uh, and then to deploy to the cluster. Imagine that the cluster now is full and it's no, it's no place to accommodate resources anymore. And um, we, the, the developer will need to wait extra another five to 20 minutes uh, for a new node provision in order for his workload to be deployed to the cluster. In many use cases, this is not acceptable. Next slide, please. So in order to mitigate this issue, we came up with the idea of uh, having empty nodes or pseudo empty nodes that are always started. Uh, and basically they are ready uh, to take over workload instantly. How did we do that? So we basically leveraged on the Kubernetes concept of pod priority. Uh, for those who don't know, let me let make um, a short parenthesis. So each pod, uh, in, when it's getting deployed to Kubernetes, uh, it gets assigned a, a scheduling priority. If this is not specifically uh, defined, uh, the priority basically is inherited from the cluster default priority. Uh, now, the important part here is that if a cluster is full, so it's out of available resources, and uh, there are some pods with priority higher that needs to, be, needs to be deployed to the cluster, but in the same time, there are no available resources anymore in the cluster, but there are pods with lower priority, then the scheduler will evict these uh, pods with lower priority in order to make room instantly for the pods with higher priority. Let me close the parenthesis and um, let's explain how we designed this dummy pod. So basically this dummy pod, it's, it's a pod that runs any image, which must be non-terminating non and uh, has a lower priority than the cluster um, defined uh, cluster default priority. And it also consumes all the resources in one node. So in order to have one-to-one -one mapping with a node. Uh, another important bit here is that we don't uh, specifically define uh, custom priorities for the rest of the workload in the cluster. So all of them will inherit the cluster default priority. Next slide, please. So let's see this in action. Let's imagine we have an OpenShift cluster with three worker nodes. Two of them are uh, real uh, worker nodes. So they are um, basically have pods with uh, real application workload. We say we have application one, application two, application three, and application four. And let's also assume that these four application consumes uh, all the resources on node A and node B. We have an additional node, node C, which is this is so-called pseudo node and uh, pseudo worker node, and which has scheduled this dummy pod, which we were talking before. Now, we have a GitLab application, uh, a CICD pipeline, that wants to deploy application five. Next slide, please. However, as the cluster is now full and doesn't have available resources anymore, um, the scheduler will check if there are pods with lower priority in the cluster that can be evicted. And of course, the scheduler will realize that actually the dummy pod had a lower priority, has a lower priority than the, um, our application five, and it start evicting this pod. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this pod is getting evicting, it's terminating. Next slide, please. And after this pod is getting evicted, two actions will happen. First, the application five will be instantly scheduled to node C, and then 
the cluster autoscaler will detect that the dummy port now doesn't have enough resources. The cluster is not able to offer the dummy port enough resources in order to get scheduled. And uh, the cluster autoscaler will start spawning up a new uh, node in order to schedule this dummy port. The important part here is that the waiting time for provisioning the node is now transferred from the real workload, so from application 5, to the, to the dummy port, which is acceptable. Next slide, please. So how did we implement that? So first, we must define uh, a new priority class. This priority class we will assign to the dummy pod. As we said before, this priority class uh, needs to have a value uh, lower uh, than the cluster default priority in order for this dummy pod to be evictable. Additionally, this um, priority class and the value of this priority class should be higher than the cluster autoscaler threshold uh, because we want the cluster autoscaler to react when the dummy pod cannot be scheduled anymore in the cluster. Uh, considering the default value for the cluster uh, pod priorities is zero, and the default ratio for the cluster autoscaler is minus 10, we use um, a priority of minus 5 for our new priority class. Like this. And next, we need to create a deployment for our uh, dummy pod. So, important bits here are the following. So, first, we need to define the replicas. The replicas is basically the number of, of, of these pods, but from the other hand side, uh, because one pod maps one to one to one spot node, it is basically the number of the spot nodes we need for that specific node category. Then, the priority class name needs to be the priority we defined before. The node selector needs to be the type of the node for which you want to create the spot nodes, and the resources uh, must consist of the um, node uh, allocatable resources. So in order to fit the pod to fit exactly in the capacity of one node. The image, as I said, can be anything but must be a non-terminating image. Next slide, please. So let's draw some conclusions. First, uh, when we have a new worker that needs to be scheduled to the cluster, if the scheduler detects that there are no available resources, it can still make room for these um, resources by evicting these dummy pods with which have lower priority. After the eviction, the cluster, out, out, the cluster uh, autoscaler will detect the unschedulable pods and will start a new node in order to uh, schedule these dummy pods. This will also help uh, when we encounter a situation like, like, like this in the future, we will, we will already have some spot nodes ready to uh, be able to set workload. Now, when we consider that the cluster autoscaler uh, is doing the downscaling, so it's basically computing which nodes can be scaled down, we must also think that uh, the dummy pod will fill out the capacity, the full capacity of, of a node, and the pods that are getting rebalanced by the cluster autoscale will not have room to, uh, to be scheduled on, on this spot node, and will be scheduled on another, on another worker node. So the dummy pod will remain scheduled on the spot node until it will be eventually evicted by the um, scheduler when we encounter a scenario like we presented before. And that's it about the spot nodes. I will give the word to Solius to do the wrap up. Thank you, Radu. So just to finish a few takeaways. So auto scaling, as you can see, it works, but it requires proper configuration and some tuning to be done. Uh, GitLab turns out to be a very flexible framework, which allow us to, to configure building software for developers. And we found that container-based hybrid infrastructure suits very well for these kind of um, workloads. So thanks a lot. Thanks for tuning in.
and see you in the next ones.